All right, Entree Architect community, it's 4 p.m. Eastern, which means it's time for the Entree Architect Context and Clarity live conversation for Thursday, August 26, 2021. Thanks for joining us today as you get here. Say hi, let us know that you're here, and let us know where you're joining the conversation from if we've never met before. My name is Jeff. I'm in Indianapolis, and I'm joined by Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Jeff. I'm all right. right. Don't worry about me. I'm I'm okay. Sorry about that little (laughs) It looks like you're looking for something. Well, we won't get into it. Okay. All right. Well, if you've never been here before, we do Context and Clarity every weekday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern for one reason, so that we can find clarity around the things that matter most to you, the architect. It doesn't matter if you're the employee of a firm or you own your own firm. Maybe you've circled a date on the calendar and you said 2021 is my year and you're on the runway to starting your own thing. Or maybe you have had your own firm for a year or 10 years or 27 and three quarter years. And you're starting to rethink or reimagine what that firm could or maybe should be. All of the topics that we cover, one topic every day, they're all the need to know topics for the success of architects just like you. So thanks for joining us today. Again, say hi when you get here. Let us know that you're here wherever you are uh, on these special lives that we do every Thursday. You may be on Facebook from San Francisco, or you may be on YouTube from Boston, or you may be on Twitch from Tokyo. I don't know. Uh, Or you may be on LinkedIn from Los Angeles, like Jefferson there. That was really great timing, Jefferson. Thank you for popping in at that second. But let us know that you're here and let us know where you're joining the conversation from. We see some friends joining us on uh, Facebook right now. Some of you, like John Jones, are showing up as John Jones on Facebook. Hello from Central Westport, Connecticut. Some of you are showing up as Facebook user. Uh, If you would like to show up as yourself, as your name with your profile photograph there, you need to give Facebook permission to communicate with us. It's a privacy policy thing. We respect that. Uh, you can remain Facebook user if you'd like, uh, or if you'd rather show up as yourself, go to chat.restream.io slash FB, as in Facebook. You can see that URL at the bottom left of your screen and uh, just click on that uh, or or go to that URL, give Facebook permission to communicate with Restream and you'll show up just like Rod does uh, or uh, Nicole does or Christian does. Great to see all of you. Great great to have all of you here with us. And I see uh, uh, Kurt over there on Twitch, Yoko on Twitch. See, I told you we had lots and lots of people on Twitch. Yeah. I mean, it's we're that's we're a- almost to the half dozens by now, I think, on Twitch. So that's it's a cool. uh, it's a burgeoning <laughs> community over there. Uh, mm. Great, to, great to have all of you. What did we What did we miss, Catherine? I think you covered it all. We're glad to have you back from the past um, today. <laughs> yes, thank you. I was stuck in 1982 yesterday. Mm-hmm. We had big storms roll through uh, yesterday morning, actually. I was on a Zoom call, which ended very abruptly, and uh, we lost power and internet and actually cell service uh, for uh, into the early evening. So, interesting day. <laughs> if, you've ever, if you've ever wondered what you would do, um, yesterday would have been a good test because you couldn't look anything up. You <laughs> What'd you do? Did you play cards or read a book or what did you do? I took a nap. Oh, nice. That's good. And I, and I stood out on my porch and watched lightning. So, um, you know, there's a meme about Midwest dads, uh, that something like that. That's exactly what I did. I stood out on the mm. porch and watched lightning strike around this. So, um, so yeah, good to be back. Good to be back. Thank you for, uh, for hosting context and clarity yesterday. Mm. So like it was a good conversation. And a great lead in to today's topic, actually. Right, exactly. Uh, That's the idea. You, exactly. Yeah. Those of you that weren't able to join yesterday, uh, we asked what it would take to uh, to get homeowners interested in building science. And that's the great that's that is a, a really good segue into today's topic. So why don't I just go ahead and introduce our uh, guest today? Because we have a very we have a, a very good guest today that uh, knows an awful lot about building science. Our guest today focuses on how your home impacts your physical, social, mental, and economic well-being. She's an architect and an educator 
Her holistic view of architecture and sustainability led her to be a podcaster and a show host. So she's the host of the E3 Energy and Efficiency with Emily podcast and the co-host of BS and Beer, that's Building Science and Beer, and the founder of Matram Architecture. Emily Matram, welcome to Context and Clarity Live. Hi, thanks for having me. I, I appreciate it. It's great to have you here, and uh, it, it's also very fun to have somebody that is really well versed in all of these online things and all of these these platforms and technologies. Um, and we can also uh, sort of uh, align on on our likes and dislikes for certain services. But uh, <laughs> it's great to have you here with us today. Um, speaking of of shows and and BS and beer, I think. One question, you know, as we get into spreading the message, maybe is is a way to say that. Where did the idea of BS and beer come from? So I guess it's more like 12 years ago. Um, our local building supply company started a building, building science discussion group in Portland, Maine. And um, local professionals who were interested in kind of tossing around a lot of different ideas that were out there uh, would get together once a month and we would have a topic and we would talk about that topic and we'd hash out ideas. They'd write it on the board. We'd draw out details, architects, builders, um, anyone really in the trade. Um, and that went on for, um, is went on until the pandemic and it's you know, hopefully getting ready to, to, to start up again. Um, and then, uh, Maine is a really big state and Portland is where we have the most people, but it's not always convenient for those of us who don't live, you know, in or around the city of Portland. And so Mike Maine's actually started another group that he then called BS and Beer um, in Liberty, Maine at a brewery. Um, and so we would get together there. It was great for some people who were about an hour outside of the city. And um, we started meeting there. Now, our building science community here in Maine is pretty tight knit. We know a lot of of each other. And so when the pandemic hit, um, I have a lot of out-of-state clients. I was already using Zoom. And I said to Mike, let's just pop on Zoom and make sure everybody's okay. And so BS and Beer, as in the BS and Beer show, what it is today, kind of started as a, let's make sure that everybody in these two groups that we know our community here in Maine is okay. Do we need to share resources? Who's doing what? And how are we how are we surviving that um, in March? And um, then people who who know us, um, who don't live in Maine, who have been asking us to uh, video record our live sessions, um, which is just not possible. I mean, it's crazy. It's in a brewery. There's so much noise. Everybody talks over each other. It's awesome. Um, got wind that we were doing it on Zoom and the BS and Beer show was born. Um, and so we we have collaborators um, now. Mike and I are both in Maine. Travis is in Kansas um, and uh, or in Kansas City. And um, Ben is in Connecticut. And so we have been now nationally and I guess a little bit internationally with some Canadian residents that like to watch and some from Australia joins in. Um, and that was how the BS and beer show got its start. So. It's funny you say that it's, it was originally about checking in and making sure everybody was okay. And that's really the origin story of context and clarity. April of 2020, um, Mark LePage and I were talking and, and we said, you know what we need, there are people that need to connect, right? But then, at least in the United States, had been things had been shut down for at least a couple of weeks, if not a few weeks, and um, we were just wanted to to uh, create a place for people to connect and make sure everybody is okay. And here we are having this conversation today, what eighteen months later. So I, I love that origin story, um, and you know the idea of Maine and Kansas City and Connecticut. It uh, I haven't been able to tell so far today, but we regularly have an audience from California all the way around to Australia on these, on these sessions. So maybe we'll spread the BS and beer, uh, message far, far beyond, 
uh, which Connecticut and Canada is yeah. awesome. And for people who didn't know about it and want to catch up on the last year plus worth of topics that we've covered, they're all live on YouTube as a rewatch. So, um, so for anybody who just wants some free BS, <laughs> you can go over to the BS and Beer Show's YouTube channel. Um, like this show with context and clarity, it's so much fun to see the people in the sidebar. They're having their own discussion. BS and Beer Live is very much like that. We ask people to introduce themselves. Cool. There's a whole other conversation going on in the sidebar. But yep. the content part of it, um, so you don't get the the chat box, uh, you know, in the YouTube replay, but the content is still, you know, great. And we try to pick the questions out of the chat box and put them on the show as we can. So. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. It's a very similar format, really. Um, so the BS and Beer YouTube channel um, for the replays, um, but it's also live there, right? Yes. Live on Thursday nights. We've actually been off for most of the summer, um, minus the thing. And hi, Mike. I see you just joined us. Um it, we've been off for most of the summer and um, we're just getting ready to kickstart the fall season of BS and beer again, weekly uh, starting next week. So it'll be live again on Thursday nights starting next week. Great. Love it. So everybody can check that out on YouTube, go to BS and beer show uh, on, uh, on YouTube and uh, join, join it live or, and, or watch the uh, recorded version. So one of the things that I wondered, because as I was going through, um, you know, when Catherine and I are preparing for today's show, you know, looking at the, uh, the brew crew and, and, uh, <laughs> seeing that, you know, the origin of BS and beer was in, in Maine, there are an awful lot of, I'll say high performance building design and construction folks in Maine. Is there a reason that, and, and Maine and, and maybe that part of the Northeast, is there a reason that that's such a, such a thing up there? It's cold here. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I'm not entirely sure exactly how it came together. If it's one, because Maine is vacation land and we're very, mm. you know, we're very interested in preserving the environmental part of what we have, that more people were interested in building high performance passive house. If it's because we have some of the oldest housing stock in the country, and so it is freezing when you live in an 1850s farmhouse, and so people sold those and built something you know more efficient or did otherwise. Um, but yeah, we have a great community up here um, for lack of our code pushing that, you know, when you live in a state like New York, where you have the most stringent code, and it's as close to passive house as you can get. And then you come to Maine. And up until a couple of months ago, we had the 2009 IECC. But in spite of that, we have a great building science community here. Um, with a lot of um, and maybe we just talk about it more. I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> a lot of people who've gotten on board with it who who just really um, you know, we just say like, this is, this is how we do it. Um, and it's been great. So. Yeah. yeah, that is great. And, and it, um, I find it interesting that it, you know, I guess the seed of the idea started at the, 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 uh, the building supplier, um, rather than in an architect's office or something like that. Um, one of the questions that we had this morning was how do you get more contractors on board? But it started on that side, I guess, in, in your case. Well, I think there are a couple of things. Um, one is making it easy. So so Steve Constantino, who owns our performance building supply, makes it easy for people to get the materials that you need to use. And then, I mean, he made it easy by doing the building science discussion group for people to collaborate. So when you didn't know the answer, you, you knew there would be a, a group of other people who might be able to answer it. Um, Mike's been writing for you know, find home building and green building advisor for years. And so we'll often say, oh, go check out Mike's article on such and such. And everybody knows who, who they are. And so I think in, in some cases, that's because it's a very collaborative group, you know, unlike the traditional architect uh, builder relationship that we're, that a lot of us are familiar with in the building science world, everybody seems to want to share their knowledge, which is awesome because that's how we all get better. So. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think that's a great point. And when we, you know, we definitely want to get into this conversation about how do we get 
more homeowners or more building owners uh, involved in this conversation and, and even to the in my mind that's the next step how do we get them interested in this conversation but I you know that that collaboration I think is important and and um, across the aisle that's not the right way to say it but across the aisle from the the architects to the contractors uh, the suppliers etc it really makes a difference I think when everybody on your team is on board with that because I've done everything from community projects where homeowners have built their own houses all the way up to you know a super high performance net zero passive house level you know either deep energy retrofit or new build and there's so much room in between those two and a lot of it just has to do with education um Mike always jokes with me. I think the first time we met, I said, those who educate the market own the market. And that's because you have to tell people what they don't know. But um, we'll also at the same time have to use words that people understand. And sometimes when we say building science, people just check out already. <laughs> and so sometimes getting your homeowners on board is explaining how the thing you want them to implement works or has an impact on them particularly either their health or their emotional attachment to something or um, their comfort. You know, we're, we're getting to the point where we only have about five to eight degree window of temperature control where we're actually comfortable in spaces. So when you start talking to people like, oh, those triple pane windows, yeah, they're not going to save you a ton more energy. But when you can sit next to the window and not be cold, that's that's worth it to some people. And so just remembering to talk in terms of the things that if we educated everybody that they were experts in the field of architecture and building and construction, they wouldn't need us anymore. So mm -hmm. they expect that we know those things and that we can talk to them in terms of the things that are important to them. So, yeah, I think that's a good point. And yeah, I was about to say this again. I was going to say this morning. So those of you that aren't aware, we start uh, we start the context and clarity conversations. We have context and clarity conversations every weekday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern. Today is context and clarity live, which is our simulcast version. But we start, maybe secretly start, not really because a lot of you show up, but um, we start the conversations at 9 a.m. every weekday morning on the Clubhouse app. And that, when I say this morning, that's what I'm talking about in our coffee conversation. Um, one of the things that came up this morning was this idea of normalizing uh, building science or or healthy healthy spaces and everything that goes goes into the sustainability energy efficiency whichever way you want to slice it um, it's very evident to a lot of us I think that um, what you know we may be talking about a construction type that some people seeing oh that's too expensive um, you know my my vinyl, siding clad builder home was X number of dollars. And what you're talking about is, is twice that, or, you know, whatever is realistic. I don't even know, um, know what numbers to make up off the top of my head. But, but I think that's the question is how do we get to the point of normalizing not only the, the conversation, but the idea of maybe life cycle versus upfront cost and things like that. Yeah. Um, and I know someone asked you earlier if I know Christine Williamson. I do. She's fantastic. If you guys aren't already following her, you should be following her. She's a wealth of fantastic information. But um, when she was on my podcast, we talked a little bit about this is like, what do you put up in in the upfront depends on how long you intend to stay there, you know, whether it's a commercial building or whether it's a residential structure. And then, you know, how soon do certain things need to be replaced in that structure? And then I'll I think we've gotten to the point and I, I can't, I haven't, I haven't quite decided on this one yet. If the real estate market, it has people moving and selling their houses every five to seven years because they move into something that they don't actually like, that doesn't actually fit their needs and is cold or doesn't perform well or whatever, because we always joke that we can't get the appraisal market to give better appraisals on these high performance houses because people don't leave and they don't sell them because they're really great to live in. Um, and so 
it's always the conversation between, you know, building for the future, future sales and, you know, and longevity. And I think when you're an architect trying to sell it to a contractor, you talk in terms of durability. Nobody wants a call back in a year, three years, five years, because you've got a durability issue related to, you know, because the, the naysayers on building science are, you know, building science has caused all of our buildings to mold, which is a total lie. Not knowing what you're doing, cer you know, certainly might have. And, and I'm not saying that we didn't have to figure it out the hard way, you know, that in the 70s, they didn't air seal a bunch of buildings and not put any ventilation in and they didn't dry and they didn't create issues. But I feel like that's how you learn in any industry, right, is is that you, you know, trial and error. Um, you know, the asbestos guys who put asbestos in, it worked great for what it was supposed to do. We're also the same guys who are now taking it all back out because it's all terrible. You know, we, we learn those things. Um, so. Yeah. Well, I think, I think that's, I think that's an important idea though, right? Even, you know, you were talking about the conversation with the contractor and it reminds me that in my mastermind group, there's an architect in, uh, uh, Idaho that was complaining that their client wanted something above code minimum, right? And this is a conversation we have a lot in the, in these small architecture, small architect circles is, you know, how can we get clients interested in something above code minimum? And so this client wanted something above code minimum. They started designing it. They weren't designing to passive house standards, but you know, something better, right? And it included um, continuous insulation. And the contractor that I think may have come attached to the client, I don't remember exactly how that conversation went, said, nobody does it that way, right? It's, it's, it's <laughs> something obviously that that contractor was not used to. And ultimately, the architect lost the argument, which meant that the homeowner, I think it was a, I think it was a home, the homeowner didn't get what they initially wanted and had to settle for the normal, right? The, the code right. minimum. So when we're talking about contractors and obviously, you know, the origin of this whole conversation is fantastic because it includes everybody in that collaboration that you're talking about. But when you have to go out and, and, uh, uh, pave the way or you know, whatever the right way of saying that is, how do you, how do you have those conversations, especially with contractors that are, you know, we've been doing it this way for 30 years and we're not going to change. How, how's that conversation go? Well, so, so, uh, <laughs> hopefully this will work for other people, but, um, one, I stopped doing bid work it doesn't work for anybody. It's nearly impossible to design to a budget. If you don't have a builder, you don't know what current costs are. You don't know when the window people are going to raise the price 20%, right? So if you don't have a contractor on board during the design phase, some of those things get missed. And then you end up with unhappy clients who like the client in your story, um, didn't get what they wanted. Um, having the builder on during the design phase also helps that everybody on the team knows what what the goal is. You know, so I had a project where um, the homeowner was chemically sensitive to petroleum, so we had to try to cut as much plastic and glues and everything out of her project as possible. And from the very beginning, she said, "I want to talk to every subcontractor. I want to talk to everyone. I know this is a little bit different. It's out of the norm, but I just want them to." to realize this is why we're doing it. And that project went amazing because everybody was on board. We did things that were, you know, that the the builder brought to the table. He's like, we only use board sheathing. And I'm like, great, we don't have a stitch of plywood in this whole house. That was a huge win. And that's how they practice normally. So some of it for me is figuring out what they already know so that the things that we're changing are as minimal as possible, which hopefully will make it easier um, to kind of achieve those really important details to also have the homeowner reiterate and for the architect uh, to be involved during the design process with the builder so that they know and they can say, Oh, Hey, we've done it this way. It'll be more cost effective for our team. And as long as that doesn't have a dent in the building science or the target that you're attempting, sure. And then I've learned something new and I can 
you know, pass that on. But you're going to get the naysayers and you're going to get the people who I've been doing it this way for 25 years. I'm not doing that. Um, and those are a real struggle. And so I tell the client it's going to cost more to work with me because I'm going to have to explain it to them and I'm going to have to show up more often. I'm going to have to check this. And I'm also a hers reader. So I'll stay up, you know, show up at certain points during construction to really make sure those energy targets are being met. Um, if, if that's, you know, it, it could be as simple as just air sealing details. Maybe that's all we got into a project. Um, but generally if I start a project and they come with a contractor and that contractor doesn't have a very open mind about what we're doing, that's an opportunity that as designers, we have to remember that it's also our right to walk away from a project. Like it is my personal reputation that I have to stand on and say, I don't feel like this is the right thing that they're recommending to you. One for code reasons, two for where we live, three for we just spent six months talking about your health and now you want to do something that I'm telling you is probably not a great idea. And so it's a little bit hard. I'm not saying I haven't ever done projects like that. I certainly have done projects, but if you're breaking in a new, a new person into building science, whether you're the builder and you're breaking in your designer, or you're the designer and you're breaking in the builder, or you're both trying to get the homeowner to, to, to get on board uh, with that, it all just comes down to respect and being open-minded. And I think that's really the, the biggest key. If the people on the team respect each other, you can get to the end goal. Uh, so, I love that. If, many, if the person's been doing it for 25 years and they won't do anything your way, they don't respect you. And that's your point to take a step back and say, correct. Thanks, yes. but <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. And um, I have a, I have a little follow up question on that. Yes, so, do you please. mean, Emily, do you mean like you quit the whole project as the architect or you fire the contractor from the project? Um, well, it depends on how the project came to you. Right. So okay, yeah. sometimes you can't fire the contractor if the contractor is the one that brought the project to you in the first place. That seems okay. like bad practice. <laughs> also not <laughs> easy. I mean, I don't know how it's you also do that. not easy, um, but it's easier to take a, a step back as, you know, like this, this isn't going the way that you anticipated. And I don't feel like I can meet your expectations on this. That one's a little bit easier. Most of the time for me, though, it's just education. And once you kind of get through the, this is why we're doing it. This is what is a little bit different. Um, it doesn't usually come to that. So yeah, it, the only time it really comes to that is if you think that everybody's on board and then you get value engineered out, which as architects, we all have been there. Yeah. So. When it does come to that, which hopefully is a rarer and rarer occasion, but when it does come to that, what do you have to do to protect yourself? Because designing the way that you do, designing the building science that you do, if it's not implemented correctly, could go horribly wrong, right? So, is it simply a, you know, here's a release, you have to sign this, or what do you have to do to protect yourself in that case? Well, I think it depends on whether you're backing out of a project that you got value engineered out of. Um, if I get value engineered out and they're like, don't come to the job site, whatever, then I would do a release. Um, if it's one where the project ends before we get to final construction, um, I would definitely do a release because that would mean that people wouldn't understand. But as architects, it's also one of those weird things between like going to the job site and learning and understanding, but also not being in the position where you're telling someone what to do on a right. job site, which then changes your liability. So mm -hmm. um, being careful with your details and showing up on site, I find is usually the best collaborative effort. Um, there is always a possibility that somebody doesn't understand or doesn't follow it correctly. And that's, that's tough, but that's kind of any construction, I think, you know, oh, yeah. um, I, that's anywhere from how you attach your siding to structural pieces, to building science pieces, to, you know, you put in an ERV and it doesn't run and it's positive pressure on the inside of the house and it pushes moisture into the wall. So there's so many, and this is something that I, I feel like people are starting to grasp, but it's complicated. <laughs> Construction is complicated. And so, 
knowing how all those parts and pieces work together and that your house is a system of interrelated parts is critical. And that's usually where I start any of my building science stuff. Like if you're going to change something, it might be okay, but we should talk about it. Yeah. So, and, and more collaboration at that point. What, um, so we talked about the home or the, uh, the contractor side of it. I'm assuming that, well, I shouldn't assume how many people, <laughs> how many potential clients are coming to you that are not interested in, um, high performance design and construction? Many one at all? Of, one out of 10. And I say that because at this point, if you don't know what I do, it, you, yeah. you must not have Googled me at all. <laughs> right, but, right. Also, um, my other secondary specialty in Maine, because we have a lot of water, is anything within 250 feet of a major water body. So sometimes people come to me because they're building a camp on water or renovating a camp on water, stream, lake, river, the ocean. And so sometimes we do occasionally have a couple of projects that are you know, not year round homes that don't have to, I mean, they still follow the terms of building science and the physics of building. Like you still don't want it to get mold. You want there not to be water in your building, things like that, but they're not maybe as stringent as, you know, our, our net zero houses or, or something right. like that. So, yeah. Yeah. So most of the people that are coming to you, you, you've you've built a brand, right? This is my terms. You've built a brand uh, yeah. as as a building scientist and architect. Um, so nine nine out of the ten, right? Know what they're getting into. Let's say it yeah. that way. The the one out of ten. Is there any attempt to to convert them? Um, oh, absolutely. Um, so okay. nine out of ten know what they're getting when they show up. They're looking for it. They're asking for it. They're they're looking to do. You know, um, uh, I did a lot of energy consulting before, um, or while I was doing building my practice, and so nine out of ten know what they're getting into. They're looking for some kind of high performance. They're not looking for just code built this or that. The other percentage just get it as a byproduct because I'm unwilling to do some things. And so as a minimum, we're going to do, you know, X, Y, or Z, um, whatever that is, whatever their target goal is, if it's an addition, if it's a, if it's a renovation, if it's a new house, um, and they get a lot of education from me. Um, and depending on who they are, depends on whether or not they want to get into the weeds. I've had some engineering clients who want to know absolutely everything. And I've had some other people who have been to the job site twice during the entire design and construction process. And they're like, this is what we want. And they'll give us, you know, a feeling or a health reason or whatever. And we just produce that for them because that's just how we practice. There are just, there are some things that I'm not willing to do. Um, and so, and those people sometimes come with contractors and those are sometimes the projects that we have to just say, you know, Hey, okay, we need to make sure everybody is on board here. Yeah. But, we, we may or may not be the right fit. Right. And so it's usually not a matter of me convincing them to do it. It's saying, this is what we think is the right way to do this. Um, and that they either don't care enough about the type of insulation I want to put in there. You know, like what's the difference between fiberglass and cellulose and spray foam. And all I heard spray foam was X, Y, and Z. And I say, I wouldn't put spray foam in my house. So, you know, why would I tell you to do it? Um, and so I, I just, we go through all the details and we talk about what, what they're trying to achieve. And generally I don't get a lot of pushback on it. So how do you have that conversation? Um, you know, a lot of times I talk about meeting people where they are as, you know, we, we can't, we can't talk way above, you know, we don't want to dumb it down. We've got to meet them where they are. So when it comes to building science and, and that one out of 10 that shows up, they don't know, right? they, they don't know what they just stepped into. Um, <laughs> how, how's that conversation go? What words are you using? Um, I, I, 
don't remember. I know this is from one of the podcasts that I listened to, uh, you know, and we had Seth Godin, Seth Godin came up in one of your podcasts. Uh, we had Seth Godin as a guest, uh, months ago. And, uh, the example was, you know, you have to speak to people's emotions and, you know, what they want, uh, give them what they want, you know, then maybe design what they need, that kind of thing. But, how do you communicate with people that, that one out of 10 so that they do get it? Yeah. Um, uh, well, it definitely goes back to emotions. So, you know, we'll talk about, you know, being what's in all the materials that we bring into our house and how we deal with that. Right. So it's like, okay, the couch that you just bought is covered in, you know, stain repellent, formaldehyde, all these other things. Well, we're going to build a tight house because one, we have to via code and two, it's the right way to do it. And so we need to provide healthy air for you to breathe, right? So people understand breathing. Well, we're creating a lung system for your house. It shouldn't breathe through your skin. It should breathe through the lungs and that's where the fresh air comes through, you know? And so like we build tight and we add ventilation and that ventilation will help you during allergy season, you know, um, I don't practice on the West coast, but it helps during wildfire season. You know, um, it can help, uh, some people sleep better at night, right? Like if you want to sleep better at night, we're providing fresh air into this one room where you go and you close the door and you're stuck in a room for eight hours. Well, if you've ever been in a conference room for your job after lunch and everybody's totally exhausted, they're completely tired, whatever. Well, there's a lot of CO2 in there. Same thing happens in your bedroom. And so it's, you kind of mentioned some of these things, which they probably have heard about, known about. You relate it to something that they understand. And then you say, this is how we're going to solve it. Because realistically speaking, it's always about solving a problem that they have. Like, why would you buying a house or building a house is probably the most money in one chunk you'll ever spend at one time. And so doing a couple of things that make a big impact on your ability to live there, being comfortable where the sun comes in, making sure that it's not too bright or um, too hot. You know, a lot of people miss shading devices. Like, Sometimes and in some places you really need to shade the windows or it's uncomfortably hot to sit in a house. And it was kind of a joke about five years ago that we didn't do air conditioning in Maine. And as the climate zones are moving farther north, we have a lot more air conditioning. But as Mainers, we don't know how to deal with air conditioning because we never had it before, right? So it's this conversation while, you know, if we're going to do heat pumps in your house, now you're going to have air conditioning as a byproduct. What does that mean during the summer months? And so it's really just kind of talking about, you know, and like go to, go to Walmart and buy a $10 humidistat. Like I don't need you to monitor everything and, and get kind of wild about it. I need you to kind of understand a couple of things that are going on in your house and how to be comfortable. The other things we're going to build into it to improve durability. So that's, that's usually how I, I go through it is talk about, talk about their health, talk about their comfort, talk about the glare from the sun or the heat from those, you know, 500 West facing windows, or, you know, I said water, Maine's got a lot of water. Well, if you're on the North side of the lake and you want an all glass front to your house, looking at the lake, you're going to be cold. <laughs> like it's, it's not going to be great. So we try to talk through those, those things. Yeah. I love that. And so Mike Maines is an Emily fan. <laughs> Obviously he said your approach is very approachable. <laughs> yeah. Mike and I do a bunch of stuff together. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I think, I think that, I think that's a great comment. Your approach is approachable. And I think that's a lesson for architects, no matter if we're talking about building science or anything, right. It's, we all have this, this, curse of knowledge, right? Well, I, I understand this. I know this. So everyone else must, right? Well, no, absolutely not. How many years did you spend studying this in school? How many years have you studied uh, either in an internship and, you know, and, and your specialties, right? Your HERS rating and, and all of your other, uh, all of your uh, other accreditations that you have, that's an awful lot of knowledge and expertise that every architect 
no matter what their specialties are, has. We've got to we've got to keep that in mind. This curse of knowledge. Your clients are not architects. That's why they're coming to you. They don't understand these things. That's why they're coming to you. Well, they don't understand it. And and I know you're an educator as well. Um, I think we don't know how well we understand it until we have to teach someone else exactly what it is. And so, um, yeah, I've, I've been a lifelong learner in this. I mean, my grandfather had a solar panel on his roof to heat hot water when I was a kid. And so just from the beginning, and I grew up in a farming community and a lot of farmers will reuse everything, you know, and it's a very farm to table. And so I think I just was brought up this way and then I'm a lifelong learner. So every time, you know, I got to do CEUs, I got to do continuing education. And, you know, I started with a bunch of different certifications until I got to the passive house certification. The guy says to me like, why are you here? (laughs) So I'm like, well, you're going to teach me something I don't know yet. Right. And so for me, it's often important to repeat those things to to the builders, to architects, to other designers, to my students, yeah. because it's always better to assume that someone doesn't know and give a refresher than to, you know, to assume they do know. You know, and I say this in my sustainable design class, too, is if I'm talking about something and you don't know what I'm talking about, I don't know that you don't know. So you have to tell me. And so it's, you know, after you've learned some of these things and, and just even working with the other people in, in my office is I forget that I've just done that so long that I know that's what you do. But when you don't know that, like it's and so you're exactly right as, as we do have to, you know, kind of talk about it, repeat it, say it in a different way because we don't all learn the same way. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, so I have a question. Um, <clears throat> so I think one time when we were talking, Emily, you were talking about the BS and beer show and trying to reach homeowners a little bit with that possibly. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering what would be, what's the method that you would use to reach the homeowners and get them to even watch the show or be interested in the subject, you know, because, because it, I mean, I think a lot of it starts with the homeowners wanting, wanting to implement a lot of these things. Right. So so there are a bunch of different types of shows that we do on the BS and beer show, everything from expert level shows where we have people who know 10 times more than I do come on and talk about specific topics. And then we also try to have a show where I just talked about, I mean, I think we did one show, which was like, how does your heat pump work? Right. Because people are hearing heat pumps, you know, and all this stuff. And I feel like that's one thing. And, and I know this is because of my hers rating training. Um, but whenever I have a new homeowner who moves into a house and it's heated with heat pumps, I go through like, this is how the heat pump works because it works differently than, you know, your traditional heating system. And like every time we have to do that. Right. So we try to do shows where we'll talk about something they've either heard about or might know something about that they are going to get asked about on, um, on their project. Right. So someone might want you to weigh in on this. Um, we try to keep a couple of shows where the level isn't so far over your head, where it's so technical that they wouldn't be interested. We do case studies where we'll talk about, you know, this is a project and these are all the things that went into this really cool project because I think, and especially from my podcast as well, they respond very well to other homeowners talking about their experience, what they did, how it worked for them. Um, and so that's, that's a great show type to get homeowners kind of a little bit more interested in it. They're not going to come and listen to the super technical down in the weeds, uh, stuff, but we have a show on kitchen ventilation. You know, and it's like, Mm. even I had to kind of laugh during the show and you'll see me laughing and and doing other things. I'm pretty sure it's Travis's goal to make me laugh during every show. Right. Um, But I, I said off the screen in our chat box, I was like, did he just say I have to use my range vent hood when my toaster is on? Right. And so it's like, sometimes they're just super practical things. If we're trying to get people off of fossil fuels, so no more gas ranges or something would we'll do a show on induction ranges because that's, right. that's new and it's different. And people want to know everything from 
how does it work and how does it cook to is EMF radiation a problem and do I have to worry about this? And so there's all kinds of things that we talk about on different shows to, to try to cover that. We've also, um, we do book club usually once a quarter and sometimes we'll do a really technical, you know, book. And sometimes we'll do, um, you know, what's the best getting into building science book, right? So, cause we have a lot of clients who are like, I need, I want to know more about these things that you're saying. Like, I don't understand it. Like where's, where's the book that, kind of dives in and a little plug for, uh, someone just posted pretty good house. Um, so Mike and I, and Chris and Dan Colbert are working on writing the pretty good house book. And this is supposed to also be geared toward, and the pretty good house is also geared towards, um, both building better without building to a certification and how to help homeowners kind of understand some of these things that we're talking about building better. Like, how do I just build a better house? You know, if I'm going to go to the point where I'm having something completely custom designed for me, how do I build it better and not just build the things that I want? So, which is okay. like a nice kitchen. Everybody wants a nice kitchen. <laughs> So how do you reach out to them, though, or how do you find them, or how do you attract them, or do they, you just um, help people who end up showing up? Yeah, to the show, or... Well, it depends, because all of my homeowners know that I do the show, and a lot of them tune in, so we'll be in the middle of design phase, and they'll tune in, or they're thinking about building, and they've kind of approached me to hear about it on my podcast or my Instagram feed, because I do, I do everything on my Instagram feed from posting beautiful photos of architecture, right? That, that lures people in, right? All architects design things that are beautiful. Everybody has a different style, whatever. We design things that are really beautiful. People like that. So you draw them in, then they start reading your other content. Then they're like, what is this? What's this other information? Um, so in some ways, I think we do that. We've also had different groups who have talked about BS and beer that are more homeowner centric, you know, and, and Catherine, I had you on my podcast. We did, you know, back to back podcasts where you're, you know, doing the homeowner. So now they've heard me that they, they look me up. Now they see BS and beer and they see the podcast. And yeah. for me, it's um, Chinese water torture, right? So it's just like, keep, <laughs> no. keep the, keep yeah, the, keep the dropper going and just, you know, keep spreading the word. And, and that was, Years ago, I had a blog, but people kind of stopped reading a lot of blog stuff. And that was why I started the podcast, because anybody who traveled or, you know, who did a job where they could listen to a podcast while they were working as well, yeah. um, it resonated, I think, really well. And I try to do other homeowners, right? And then they respond to that. Because if you Google, you know, what was another homeowner's experience? So we'll do a show like what you need to ask your architect when you're trying to hire an architect or what you need to ask your builder or um, just trying to dissolve some of the mystery behind it. Well, most of you didn't, you didn't tell us whether or not you are supposed to have your vent hood on when you're using your toaster. You are, you, you are. are. If you're using your toaster, those burnt particulates because we all burn the toast. Not so good for you. So if you're using wow. your toaster, you should also be using your range vent hood. I'm fairly certain that after that show, everybody decided they were going to cook outside on their grill or get takeout. <laughs> and no one's cooking in their kitchens anymore. <laughs> well, that frees up a little square footage too. <laughs> yes. Or if you, um, if you, I don't know if you guys know Lloyd, Lloyd Alter from, from Tree Hugger. Uh, he was saying, you know, our kitchens, Everybody wants an open concept now. But realistically speaking, our kitchen should really be separate from the rest of it because a lot of the toxins that are in our cookware, in the stuff that we burn, in you know, in our range vent hood, shouldn't be hanging out in the rest of our house either. So, yeah, pretty much anything I cook should not be hanging out <laughs> in the rest of our house. So there's that too. <laughs> yeah, so me too. Christian had a question earlier about how much of your, because you're an architect and so mm -hmm. you get paid to do that <clears throat> and then you do so many other things as well. So he was wondering what percentage of your income, I don't know if this is a polite question or not, but how, what percentage of your income comes from being an architect and versus 100%. the rest of the hundred percent from being an architect and zero percent. All of my content of right now from my podcast, YouTube, BS and beer is all, um, from the kindness of my own heart. Yeah. 
P- part okay. of the question was also uh, on your uh, different, your HERS ratings. And mm-hmm. um, do you separate that from being an architect? Is that, or do you, are you only doing that on your own projects? I'm only doing it on my own projects right now, just because the market is so crazy. If we're really, really busy and right. I don't have time to do HERS ratings or individual um, uh, cert- certification programs from projects that aren't my own. So I wish that I did. Um, I do know a couple of other people here in the state who do them, and that's usually who I recommend um, other people to. Yeah. There, there was another question that came up this morning. I think Heather asked it, and she was asking about um, the, the difference between facilitating and being an expert. And, you know, there, there are a lot of architects in the United States, obviously, and, and we – we have an international audience here as well. So um, there are a lot of art architects that are not experts in building science. So what if you're one of those that's not an expert in building science, but you want to do what you can to provide uh, high performance architecture for clients? How do you, how do you balance? How do you, how do you go from, you know, Hey, I know I'm not an expert. I need some help. I need to be a facilitator versus maybe it's even part, maybe part of of what's wrapped up in here might be imposter syndrome too. Hey, I'm not an expert. So how do I balance these things? How, how do I be the best facilitator if I'm not an expert? I think this question applies to all of design and construction and not just building sciences. It's all about your network. Um, If you want to get into it and you want to do more with it, you find the people who already know how to do it, right? So there are passive house consultants. There are HERS raters all over the country. Um, You know, in Canada, I think you have some different certifications. Um, I don't know about all the countries. I mean, passive house started in Germany, right? So there, there's stuff in your local area. There are already people who are doing it. Um, and so the first step is to partner with one of them. And honestly, there are, are and I just had a, uh, huh, I just recorded a podcast with them. It'll be up in September. Um, <laughs> there is a, a hers provider who is now offering different types of, um, certifications, some for architects who don't want to go into the field and do their own test outs so they can do the the knowledge part of it. So you can build that in and do energy modeling as part of your project. There are some field ones for people who just want to do the field stuff. They want to go out, they want to test, they want to see that everything's working properly, etc. So there, there are different ways to do that. For architects, as we move towards doing continuous certifications um, or continuous education, it's pretty easy to take one of these certification classes. And especially now with that being online, right? It used to, it was really inconvenient for me. I had to go to New York city to take the passive house course for two weeks, right? So stay in New York city. And you know, that that's sometimes out of the realm of financial possibility for uh, especially young architects who want to kind of Maybe they've got just gone out on their own. They want to start offering this. It wasn't offered at the company that they were at. And so there are small incremental steps that you can take to to get there. Um, personally, yes, I think all architects should be uh, hers rated or passive house trained and everybody should have a blower door. Um, <laughs> people have heard me say that all the time. I think everybody should have a blower door. It's the best thing. Um, but We can do it through our continuing education. You can take Christine's class, which talks about, you know, just building science can just be proper water management, right? Where does the water go? How does it get through the materials? Like we're, we're dumping materials onto the market faster than we're researching how to use those in combination with each other, right? So sometimes it's a simple, like, do I know what this sandwich looks like and where the water will go when I have it put together? Um, so you can take Christine's class. You can take a hers rating class. Um, for me, that was really critical. I worked for a firm in Washington, D.C. that was residential. They didn't do much. It was way back in 2006 when LEED was kind of the only thing available. And it was LEED for new construction, which meant it applied to commercial and residential. It wasn't 
totally applicable. And I just kept going down the chain, you know, auditing, hers raters, passive house, taking all the different certifications till I learned not all the things that I want to know. I still have some more to go, you know, well, well buildings and living building challenge, you know, but anyway, that's beside the point. But so you can, you can do some of the training and we, and you learn a lot. But in the meantime, if you're imposter syndrome, it's all about your network. Um, and you said something about Mike. Honestly, I talk to Mike every day. And when I'm not 100% sure, you said expert. I don't consider myself an expert. I know a lot of things, but I don't consider myself an expert. I'm, <laughs> I got to learn more things. Um, but I talk to Mike every day and I'll say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. You know, what am I missing? Right. It's all about the network that you have to connect to because there's somebody out there who knows it. Um, it's the same problem I have with the architectural registration exams where you have to memorize something to take a multiple choice test. Like in my class, it's always open book because it doesn't matter if you memorize it, you need to know where to go to find the information when you need it, right? Like you need to know where to look in the code book. You need to know where to look in my building science book to find that heat loss calculation when you're not sure or to convert your CFM to ACH. You just need to know who to ask or where to find the information. And that's probably the best thing that you can, that you can do is find a network of other people who are interested in it. They don't even have to be in your same area from your show and from, from the BS and beer show. These people are everywhere. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I also like that, you know, not to jump onto the academia side, but none of this, none of this knowledge is static either, right? It evolves and we learn more. And like you said earlier, we, we learn by doing sometimes it's by mistake, things like that. So, um, you know, I, I think we need to uh, keep that in mind as well. You, you mentioned, we talked really close to the top of the show about, you know, all, all of you, all of you building science people, not all of you, obviously, but, <laughs> but uh, uh, all you building science people being in Maine. If, if there is a young architect, let's say that wants to start building a practice based on high performance uh, architecture, or high performance design, high performance building, and they're in, so I'm in Indianapolis. So let's just say they're in Indiana, which is, it's not technically what a lot of people think of as the heartland, but it's about as heartland as you're going to get. And um, land is cheap, fuel is cheap, vinyl siding is everywhere. How how would you recommend someone start carving out a practice um, that's based on building science in a place where you mentioned codes earlier. Oh my gosh, I, I would have to look it up right now to know, but we're typically decades behind in uh, on uh, uh, model codes here in Indiana. How should somebody start when the demand is different than it is in Maine or New York or something like that? Well, I think it's also important to remember that what we're doing in Maine is not what you would do. I mean, correct. we... Yeah. One things that are available to us, you know, so we'll often talk about, you know, wood products, which are easy for us to get, you know, we, we mill a lot of stuff here, or we'll talk about double stud balls, like for you to build a double stud ball would probably be silly. And so it comes down to a matter of availability. Um, and then asking for that availability. So I know a lot of times when we talk to to Travis out in Kansas City, you know, he's he'll say the same thing. He'll say, yep. you know, I can't get that here or, you know, who's the supplier? And so we try to talk to people who, you know, for products that we have everywhere, you know, like how do we get Sega carried in? your local supply house so that it's not you having to order something online that takes forever to get there, whatever, you know, and, and what's a, what's an easy switch or choice, right? So like maybe cellulose isn't easy to get, maybe you can't get cellulose in, in that area, but could we switch from fiberglass to rock wool? And that might be a better solution. Or, you know, can we not put spray foam in, which is expensive, but meets the air sealing targets, but use a membrane instead, right? And so it, it's it's sometimes not going to be, and and even in the Northeast, we had to evolve too, you know, mm -hmm. right? And and um, 
someone actually who came to visit us recently said, you know, I was shocked at how much vinyl there is in Maine. I mean, there's still a lot of vinyl here as well. So we talk about things, you know, the offcuts to wood siding for us can, can be recycled. They're biodegradable. Um, people can burn them in their wood stoves if they've got a wood stove. And so you're not sending a bunch of stuff to the dump, right? And it costs you to send stuff to the dump. And so sometimes it's just as simple, like, let's try this one thing, because that's often then what they'll be super excited to tell you about. So um, Bob Swinburne, amazing architect in Vermont, uh, you guys here on the Entre Architect community have to know who Bob is. Um, we I had we do. Pleasure. And also he said hello. He hasn't changed from Facebook user, but he's here right now. And he did say <laughs> hi earlier. Somebody said hi, him. M. So I assumed it was him. So, <laughs> hey, Bob. I had the pleasure of interviewing um, one of his clients and, you know, th this is a super high performance house, all, all kinds of stuff. And I got to go to the job site now it's under construction, see, see and meet the client after I did the interview with them. And he told me all about how much they salvaged from the original house. Like this was this, this cool thing that they were really. And so sometimes when you're starting out, it might have to be, where you find the one cool thing that they can latch onto, that they can talk about, that you build incrementally. I mean, we started first with just doing better job air sealing. So when I was doing a bunch of community projects, we just tried to get our target really low. Like how do we air seal in an easy way that's easy for a homeowner who's building this house to understand? You know, and then we we moved to dense packed cellulose walls. And then we moved to getting rid of the oil boilers because we did so good when we were air sealing that we were backdrafting them, which was bad. So <laughs> um, sometimes it's just simple things, you know, and now our code just changed and we have to do a continuous layer of insulation. And so we said, you know, here are your options. You can do um, continuous exterior insulation. You can do uh, T studs or you can do a double stud wall. What do you think is going to be the easiest for your, your homeowner to understand? And so we batted around ideas and we made that switch for them. Um, and so it's, it's incremental. And I think if we were keeping up with the codes, we would stop saying the code built house is the worst one. If everybody just kept going to the next level, then to the next level, to the next level. And that it's, you know, it's not that we're asking you to build a zone seven passive house in Indiana, right? Because that would right. be silly. That would be a waste mm -hmm. of your money. We would never right. recommend that. Yeah. But it's about knowing what you have available to you as a resource, knowing what's in it right? Because we're building these houses and we're building them tight and we're leaving homeowners with who knows what in, you know, in the houses or that they're going to bring into the house afterwards. And so sometimes it can be simple. We did a wall system competition um, through BS and Beer uh, and it was uh, through Travis's group. And I think the wall system, they either won or came in second, had T111 uh, siding, you know? I mean, who was a T111 wall without continuous insulation because in that location, it was cost effective. It made the most sense. It improved the efficiency. And so I hope that people don't kind of get stuck on going to the level that we have to in the Northeast to stay warm when it's negative 15, but can apply what might be available to them. And then if it's not available, start asking for it. So you know, asking the local lumber supplier or building supplier or whatever to carry, carry these things. Cause they'll say like, Oh, we can't, we can't sell FSC certified lumber because no one buys it. Well, if no one knows you carry it and you only have three sticks of it, we can't buy it, you know? So right. like chicken and egg. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> so Sean, I, Sean wants to know what a blower door is and where you can buy one. Because everyone has to have one. So he's um, on his way. Minneapolis and Retrotech both make blower doors. Um, and essentially, it depressurizes a house to see how leaky that house is. And we use it in a couple of different ways. One, um, as the codes get more stringent, we use it to make sure that we're meeting the code. So the 2015 IECC 
says uh, three air changes or less. I think 2021 might be even lower than that. Um, and uh, we use it for blower door guided air sealing because it's really hard to air seal something at once you only have switch plates to put on. So it's a lot easier to figure out um, where your air barrier details need to be improved. Um, and anywhere you have air movement, you have water. So sealing the air really helps with water in buildings. Um, so we do blower door guided air sealing. And um, if you're doing any kind of certification, passive house hers rating, et cetera, uh, you need that number to evaluate how much um, air your house has to reheat every hour because that's an energy penalty. So that's where you would use a blower door. They're really simple. I think everyone should have access to a blower door. So if there are a couple of you in a similar area and you can buy a blower door together and share it, because honestly, you're not going to use it every day, all day. You're going to use it periodically. It's not the cheapest piece of equipment to buy, but it's not in my opinion, not terrible. It's a great investment. Go in together with a couple of people, share the equipment that you need to, or borrow it from somebody who has one. Or meet a HERS Raider, a Passive House Raider. Uh, <laughs> they all have them. Ba so. Back to your network. Mike says some libraries rent them. I don't know if that's a Northeast thing. <laughs> it's, I think that might be code for something. I'm not really <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, I don't sure know what kind that. of reaction you might get if you went to the library asking yeah. about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. they used to have the energy meters that you could plug in and see how much electricity your, your refrigerator was using. So, At the true. library. At the library. They have a lot of weird stuff at the library or things you might not imagine at the library, actually. Very useful. I'm, I'm going to have to check that out. I'm gonna walk <laughs> in and say, hey, I'm here. We should buy a every door. library a blower door and then people would always have access to it. There's an <laughs> idea. <laughs> or create a tool library, which the Facebook user, maybe that's Bob. Mm, uh, Hans. Was, oh, Hans, Hans. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Hans. That's a Portland great Bay. idea, Hans. I second that. Tool libraries. There you go. That's a Good great idea. idea. Get a pod <laughs> and a, a lock. People can just go put their combination in, borrow, put it back. Or a fob. You could have a pod and a fob and you'd be all set. Yep. Hmm. <laughs> you mentioned uh, codes a minute ago, and that's a great segue to tomorrow's topic too, because tomorrow we're going to talk about the future of codes. What are the future? Do they need an overhaul? And specifically, what roles should architects be playing in the future of code writing, code adaptation, or not adaptation, adoption? Um, so that's tomorrow's topic for context and clarity conversation, both at 9 a.m. on the Clubhouse app and at 4 p.m. Eastern uh, for the context and clarity conversation in the Entree Architect Community Facebook group. Emily, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate everything that you shared. I think we could probably keep going for several hours, but... Um, <laughs> That's because I talk too much. Everybody who knows me knows that. <laughs> not, not at all. This is this was great. And uh, um, I, my encouragement to everybody, you know, I'm my, my role in in this profession is the marketing, the brand, the business development part. Um, my encouragement to everybody is really listen and understand what Emily was talking about in terms of being approachable as, as Mike put it, but, but meeting people where they are, helping them understand what's in it for them. Because what she was talking about in terms of getting people on board with high performance the building science and everything else is applicable to whatever you do, right? If, if you are, um, who knows where uh, Indianapolis, Indiana and, uh, building science, isn't your thing. Fine. That lesson that Emily just taught us about being approachable and the emotion, uh, appealing to the emotions, et cetera, that's really applicable to you helping people understand what you do and how you can help them and what problems uh, you can solve for them. So Emily, I appreciate it on a whole lot of levels. This is a good conversation today. Well, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it.
It's great to have you. And everybody check out uh, BS and Beer Thursdays. What time, Emily? Thursdays at 6 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. You can go to the BS and Beer Show website. It'll ask you just to register the first time. Then it's the same link every week after that. Perfect. And so that uh, that URL is up on the screen right now. If you're listening on the podcast, the recorded audio only version of this, it's the BS and Beer Show, all spelled out. The spelled out B S A N D Beer Show dot com. I'll smush together like one word. The B S and Beer Show dot com. Go check that out. Watch and participate in the BS and Beer Show, six p.m. Eastern. Uh, on YouTube, go to that URL first to register and um, learn about building science. Invite people. Or if you're an architect, invite your clients to uh, the beer, BS and Beer Show. Help them understand more about what you're talking about. Engage them in the conversation. That's what we've been talking about all week, really, on uh, context and clarity is engaging a larger audience. So uh, check out, start by checking out the BS and Beer Show. And uh, again, Emily, I thank you. All of you out there in the audience, wherever you are, the hundreds of you now on Twitch, uh, all of you on on Facebook and YouTube and LinkedIn as well. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for all of your questions and comments and uh, and making context and clarity a thing. Because if you hadn't made context, context and clarity a thing, we wouldn't be having this conversation with Emily right now. So I uh, appreciate all of you for that. And Catherine, thanks as always for keeping the wheels on this bus. <laughs> Keep us headed down the right road. Yeah. And I missed all of the chat box. So if people have specific questions, feel free to reach out to me. I just couldn't keep up with the chat box. No, it, it goes by fast. And we, you know, we warned him, well, you know, you can just, yeah. clo- just close your eyes to that. You don't have to watch that. It's the same on the BS and beer show. Come just to chat with your friends. Come for, for the entertainment uh, on the show. This yeah. is great guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Thank Emily. you. Appreciate you. And uh, all of you out there. Thanks again, please. Stay well, be well, encourage those around you to do everything they can to stay well. Still a little bit weird out there. And uh, find a little bit of time to breathe tonight, rejuvenate a little bit, because we're going to do this again all over tomorrow. So uh, see you again tomorrow. Same bat time, same bat channel, 4 p.m. Eastern. And if not then, I hope I'll see you somewhere sometime soon. Thanks, everybody.